Hello, everybody. This is Rich, and you are watching This Imaginary Life. Uh, this is um, basically a, a GM discussion show, kind of like car talk for RPGs, where I get together with some very experienced individuals who have played tabletop role-playing games for a significant portion of their hobby uh, life. And uh, I, I've, I've said I'm rich, so next we'll go with Eric. How are you doing tonight, Eric? I am doing well. After the long holiday break for myself, I haven't been around for a little bit. Good, good, good. And next we have Lowell Francis, also of Play on Target. How are you, Lowell? I am doing awesome. And then, last but not least, we have Strash Atuvich, who is currently developing what Atlas Rising is that the name of the Atlas uh, Reckoning? Doing it. Okay. I try so hard to know all the names of all the games that are being made, and I fail sometimes. I'm sorry. You'll get it right one day. Atlas Reckoning. I mean, you should think about Atlas Rising. Maybe <laughs> That's the sequel. <laughs> well, uh, we'll make sure to make a hack just for you. Atlas <laughs> Revengeance. Okay. Um, so then we're going to kick off as we as we normally do, where we talk about a uh, minute and a half because we've we've decided that we no, none of us can talk for two minutes besides Eric. Uh, minute and a half about stuff that we're into, and Eric's going to lead it off. So Eric, I have the timer ready to go, and here you go, sir. A minute and a half is yours. Drop. Start her up. All right. So I am super super excited that I have finally got my weekly group that plays nothing but Pathfinder to start playing other games. I can't even tell you. It is a miracle. It's one of the hardest things to do. Um, if you have a very dedicated system that your your group loves, getting them to switch is like trying to get them to use a new brand of toothpaste. It's damn near impossible. Um, so we switched from playing Pathfinder all time to a combination of Numenera, and we are going to be playing... I just picked this up at... Game Hole Con, we're going to be playing Icons as well. Huh. Um, I'm super excited to see how this turns out. I love a little superhero in my life, but I guess the system is pretty phenomenal. The book is beautiful. Got the talk from the artist while he was there. So not only am I playing one new system with him, which Numenera I've become a very large fan of, um, I'm also going to be able to play a superhero game as well. Um, I don't know about everybody else, but changing people from a system to a new system, I think the first three times we get together to play, maybe the most teeth gritting, painful thing I have to do as a GM. I, I, it was, it's bad. Nothing makes sense. They're all used to tactical grids. There's no tactical grids in Numenera, which is why I'm happy. There's GM intrusions. They feel like I'm dicking them over when I do that. And that's not what it's about. Like, no, it's about storytelling. And then finally, when you get like through that third session, they're all in. So my group is loving it. Okay, stop, timer. Okay, yay. There we go. Man, that's awesome. Congratulations. Uh, Dude, it's rare. Joe you know Hart, I mean, seriously. I have other groups that'll play whatever, but my main group only played Pathfinder. Before that, it was 3 5. Before that, it you know, that's that was the path that we followed. I got him to even skip 5 E. <laughs> All right, so who wants, to, who wants to go next? Oh, I'll go next. All right, Lowell. A minute and a half, you are on the clock. Uh, so this is the big week for me. This is the week I do five games, uh, play in one and run four from Sunday through uh, yesterday. Three face-to-face games, sorry, yeah, three face-to-face games, homebrew, L5R, Fantasy Guards, and then a multiversal game. And I'm running 13th Age online. Um, and then played Rollmaster with Sean Sanford. I uh, hadn't played Rollmaster in a number of years, and... Uh, my wife's playing with us, and boy, we've forgotten just how, just how terrible you are at low level. I mean, and you stay terrible for so long. Um, had a chance to play Dungeon World as a time before we, before the we started uh, uh, after New Year's. So that was something I hadn't tried before. Um, I did a couple of, I did a session of Fate Court teaching session of that online, and I'm going to do another one of those uh, in a week. Um, working on a couple of games, including Magic Inc. Uh, which I posted some stuff for uh, online. And let's see, we had a really good response to the Play on Target Apocalypse World GM jam that we did. Um, people like that and uh, got gotten some very good response. We're hoping to do more of those. And I'm working on the history of post-apocalyptic games. Should be coming out this week. We're covering 97 through 99. 
which includes some really weird uh, GURPS uh, uh, source books, including uh, GURPS uh, New Sun and stuff. So that's my minute, minute and a half. Wow, that was awesome. Man, very good, very good. Shosh, if, if you're ready, you can go or I can go, man. Uh, I'll jump in. All right. You are on the clock. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, it's the new year, so uh, it took us a couple weeks to get back on target. Uh, but started playing games. I'm participating in Epi's 51 and 15, where you try and play 51 different games in uh, 2000, uh, 2015. So uh, that's going pretty good. I've got three or four under my belt already. Uh, I've got, got, got a couple more that people are actually in the process of designing. Uh, some cool stuff coming up. I have a friend who's working on a Silk Road game. Uh, my friend mm. Kit is working on Arcadia, which is kind of like uh, slightly <coughs> pre-Victorian England with uh, all sorts of high society and then thrown to the mix fairies. Things get really weird. It's like normal and strange. And then uh, I've been... Actually, I, I finished... Uh, a, a chapter of work on, on AR, so my, I'm waiting on my partner to finish his bit, and while he's doing that, I'm working on some new games myself, so it's been exciting over in this neck of the woods. Uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll seed you my 30 seconds, sir. Wow, that's that's awesome. That's a lot of good stuff to talk about uh, for a minute and 30 seconds. Is the um, is the 51 games any games? Like, it doesn't matter what it is, like board game, card game, video game, everything, or is it just strictly RPGs? Uh, so, uh, according to the rules, it can be anything. Uh, as a matter of fact... It's uh, anything tabletop, actually. Yes, it's anything tabletop. Well, it's not, not true. Not a digital game. LARP, LARP is okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I'm, I'm sticking mostly to RPGs. Uh, I've, kept a tr I've kept track of the card and board games I'm playing. Uh, you know, just in case I don't quite cross the threshold, but I'm working on it. Well, 51's so. a lot, man. Like, you'd almost have to put in card and board games that... Mm -hmm. almost. It's almost like cheating and she like. But I am challenging myself because I think I could do it. So I'm I'm already past way past the January mark. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. I'll just real quick before I go. Um, Yona uh, uh, Hunt yeah. and Andrea uh, Gauke, They the two of them did a challenge for 2014 of uh, new RPGs to them. So this was all all new games. Play them. And uh, they're on the Dr. Tom episode that's coming out not tomorrow, but the next Monday, uh, and they will reveal their numbers, which trash 51. Oh, yeah, they're crazy. Yeah, they're crazy. Insane. Let's, let's just say the two of them wow. took 51 out back and, and plugged it in the back of the head. Yes. <laughs> it, was, it was like, I can't believe how many games they played. And they were all RPGs. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to do my minute and a half. All right, here we go. Um... So Dr. Tom, I mentioned that. I'm super into being the production assistant for Dr. Tom the Frog show where it's like a talk show where this like crazy frog who's a doctor talks to RPG people about their hobbies, some game designers, people who just love games. It's really, really fun show and I've been happy to be part of that. It comes out every Monday on the Indie Plus. I am about to start playing in a game of uh, Spark, the RPG, for the first time. I got that in the Epimus bundle. Uh, Epimus bundle just like blew up my RPG collection. It's like most of the games I got in 2014. So good. Um, I'm playing in Masks, which is a playtest of uh, a Teen Supers game, uh, as well as uh, No Country for Old Cobalt. We're currently playing that in our little mini-series game. That's a fun little paranoia-type game. Uh, Winter's Awesome is the Samurai World hack that Taylor wrote up and can never publish because it's basically L5R with Marcos Roll Mechanics. So a lot of Hangout games going on. And then um, I've got seven play-by-post games that I'm either running or playing. So I've got a whole lot of games. Pretty much Dr. Tom, some Indie Plus stuff every once in a while, and uh, lots of games. I, uh, I'm done. And we can stop at 10 seconds. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Whooshing noise on my end? I don't think yeah. that's... I know your voice keeps cutting in and out for me. Huh, okay. Uh, is any better now? All right, cool. Oh, yeah. So sorry. Okay, no. Yeah, it seems that there's this there's a weird sound. I don't know if it's gonna translate through or not, but yeah, yeah. I can totally hear it too as well. That is really weird. Right on. Hmm. I don't hear it. Yep, that's absolutely me. Okay. okay. 
Hmm. I wonder if it was speaker interference. Any better now? Yeah, actually. Yeah. Okay. I had it near. I had my mic near the speaker. I wonder if it was getting some feedback there. So okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm doing a lot of games. That was the short version of my minute and a half. Uh, all right, so the main topic that we have picked out here, and of course, questions and answers are on. So if you have questions for us about things that are going on at your table, please do let us know. I don't, know. I see we have one live viewer, but if there are more who jump in, let us know. But we're going to talk about uh, so the holidays have just come and gone, right? For whatever holiday you have uh, within the, the the November December time frame that you you hold special, or if it turns out that you don't care about any of them, but some of your game group happens to. This is the place, uh, December is often where campaigns go to die. <laughs> uh, I have lost in my yes, semester, college career, I, I lost several campaigns go into the end of the semester. It sounds like my background noise has come back again. Uh, so I go into the end of the semester, and the next semester it was a real trial. Uh, Lord, yeah, do you want to take over while I play with my audio and see if we can get this conversation going without my... Sure, absolutely. Um, so, Straz, you said you were having some problems with with this, this this season. Did you have some games kind of die, or they just kind of feel like they're lethargic and they come back? Uh, <clears throat> that's, a tough, uh, that's a tough question. Uh, so, yes, I, I, I had a, uh, at least two campaigns going into December that are... Uh, I'm going to say they're technically on hiatus, uh, but I don't know how, how optimistic I am that things are going to get back up and up to speed. So I know that uh, the, the first cycle, because we, uh, both of, whenever we play like long-term campaigns, we usually do bi-weekly, but the first cycle was, uh, was off. We were short players. One night we ended up doing board and card games, and so uh, when, when one of my Saturday campaigns got canceled, so... Uh, I don't know. It's it's still in that uh, it's it's still in the doghouse. It, it may recover, but I'm not 100 percent sure. So, Eric, have you had that that problem as well? Oh shit! I think my group has had that happen every holiday season. Um, really? Well, more I think more in college it was a little easier to handle in high school even. When we got older, I think that holidays put a big damper on stuff because everyone forgets everything about that fantasy world that you're in and we come back and they're like what what were we doing again even if you have really good notes we have an amazing note taker in our group like she writes up the entire session it's insanity I feel like I'm reading the five hours that we play um, even with those people just fall out of love with their character fall out of love with the campaign and revitalizing that has become an art form <laughs> it's kind of difficult for myself, um, a lot of times I will send out something before and recant what's going on, or I really like to send out an audio, like a kind of like a voice memoir of what we've done so far. And sometimes that really gets people back into it. Sometimes I've built a playlist of music that matches what we got done doing recently, and I send that out to kind of get people back in. Um, and the other thing I found that works well is be interactive over that time frame in character through either email text messages, whatever you want to do. It's modern. Text message works better. I know at one point in time I sent out Christmas cards to everybody from a villain in the game. <laughs> that works really well because everyone's like, what in the hell is this? And I told them, hey guys, I'm sending some Christmas cards. And it was, it was from the villain in the game with like demands for the next time we played. Uh, that worked really, really well. So I think to pull them in, you got to find a way to keep a hook in them during that holiday season. Remind them how much better gaming is than their holiday. <laughs> you, you it's know, not easy. It, yeah, no, I, interesting because we have a, a the, the 13th Age game that we had had a big break because it was alternating with another player and a lot of people have kids and stuff, so we had a, a pretty large break during that. And one of the things is, is that I hadn't yet done a full map for them. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so that was the thing I put together and sent them over the holidays was was that and that gave them something to discuss and talk about and kept them in and and focused on on the game and asking questions about it during that time. Um, Straz, anything that, that 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 have you done that you're you're happy with or on that topic that that has been successful in the past? Uh. 
I don't know. I, I've tried a couple of... Uh, I mean, I haven't sent Christmas cards, and uh, <laughs> definitely no audio. So maybe I just need to step up my game. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think... Uh, I think part of the problem is that, you know, you end on a specific note before Christmas and then people have travel planned. Uh, so I know I know we kind of wrapped up a, a, a chapter, sort of. So that, that might also contribute to it. Uh, but, I, I mean, this has happened plenty of times to me before. It's, it's just one of those things. The, the holidays are really hard, largely because uh, I know that every two weeks, um, we've talked about this before on the show even, uh, at the beginning of game, the first thing that I do is, everyone's used to at this point, what I say is, all right, so who wants to recap what happened last time? And usually every person will have something to contribute and people jump in and remind them and then I'll pull out my, my book of notes and I'll fill in the, the couple of things that they missed. Uh, but as that time frame stretches, like you, if you're playing bi-weekly and then you miss a game and it's been a month, yeah. uh, everybody struggles so very hard. And it's something that you can totally see. Like they don't remember, they're not like hooked into it. And uh, the problem with Christmas is that oftentimes that's like usually two games that you miss, and so yeah. it's just this big gap, and like the emotional investment's not there. So I've tried sending out like recaps. I've tried telling people, okay, I'm excited. This is what we're doing. Come on, guys. You know, let's get together. And inevitably, somebody's like, well, I've got this thing coming up. I don't know. I'm not gonna be able to make it this time or whatever. Like it just, uh, it's rough. So I don't know. I'm on the schedule. Uh, not this this. Uh, actually, this upcoming Saturday, so we'll see uh, if the game happens this time. So, I've had that happen too. Like, we, we have weird breaks in our group because a, a lot of people in our um, group travel, and we have some like odd seasons. And I tell people during those odd seasons, we're just going to play without them, and they can read through the crazy notes that one person writes. We're lucky there, but I did find that doing um, an invitation or doing something that has the uh, kind of like a save the date for a wedding. But having a date that goes out or a physical something in their hand that they can have, have that be an envelope with a, a physical invitation or an email with a physical invitation in it uh, with something that they get for their character in it, something that kind of draws them back into the world. The other thing I've done, too, is, like you said, with the map idea, hey, I've never made the map, here's the map. I did something like that, but I made, I think I made, like, a new power for each person who was in the group when we were doing the superhero game. Like, it mutated while we were over break. They come back with something. But they're powers that were specifically made to hurt other people in their party, and they didn't know why they got it or what caused it. Um, I've done that, but you got to have something. It has to be interactive. Like I think the more tangible, tactile, and interactive the thing is you use to keep them involved, the better chance you have that they love the idea of coming back. Yeah, it's a little work. I, I have this cap. I, I don't want to spend more than thirty minutes on whatever the hell it is I'm sending out. If it's more time than that, and then they don't show up, I've wasted valuable time. I could have been doing something else, working on a game, working on a production, whatever. But I think tactile, voice, video you put together really quick on YouTube, a bunch of images, awesome things that happen, but in a, a video format of images you Google searched, and then like splash paint over the images from like something that's going on in your campaign, if there's a rebellion, if you're playing Star Wars, or whatever is going on. That stuff's fast. And people then feel like they're involved with the world again. I, I when I had a break in one game, and it kind of was like between one season and the other, I did a uh, use PowerPoint to do the opening credits for season two with various character illustrations and things, and did, had us had it to a modest mouse song, and it was had the full thing. We were able to they were able to see it beforehand, and then we played it at the table when we started, and it was it was a good way to to remind people who was in the game, and you know. Uh, say, hey, your character's cool. You really want to come back and play them again. Yeah, we made a template for one of the modern games we're playing where there was a template I put over the pictures of NPCs in the game with a description below them, and I'd have a trailer, and all I would do is drop new people into the trailer for the episode coming up. And there was nothing better than, like, the third season when I brought back a villain they all thought was dead from way back, and you just put that silhouette up with the little colored eyes or whatever it may be. They always freaked out when they saw that crap. They're like, are you kidding me? We killed this dude. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, one, one thing that I did that was pretty successful, uh, because I saw this pattern, is that I knew that December was going to be rough, right? Because just like you said, Strash, where it's not just, like, you'll lose maybe sometimes three weeks' worth. Going into, like, November and then December and then coming out of it into January when you got crap weather it can really be rough. So I, I planned ahead, and what I did was I effectively brought the campaign to a slow point 
late November. And then in December, we did a series of effectively one-shots in the world, and so whoever could make it got that look at a whole new character, a whole new view within the world itself. And then we would tie it all together going into January. So the people who couldn't make it, they would hear from the couple of folks who were like, yeah, man, we played this awesome thing in Tokyo, and we were like monster hunters. It was crazy. They're like, well, how's Rich going to work this in? And so they, they got a little bit of a buzz going with and continue to play on consistently just plan for absences for those folks who, who spent time with family or went out of town. That, that helped. We have um, a lot of games nowadays, especially the indie games that come out, have the players make stuff for the world. Even not, not so indie, like Dresden Files. They make them have uh, make stuff for the world. For our games, we usually have the beginning. I have something where the groups make power groups, like important, either bad guy, good guy, whatever it may be relevant to the campaign setting. We haven't done it the last couple times. It's a little time-consuming. But what I do is I have them make decisions of what that power group is doing during the downtime. And sometimes if it's a bad guy, it's something crazy. If it's a if it's a manufacturer, they manufacture something new that players can now buy from, and they, they kind of get to make some decisions on what's going on during the actual time that they're not doing anything in-game. But, yeah, it, it's, it sucks. <laughs> and holidays kill gaming, man, they do. You can't always save it. If you can't save it, I always have that ace in the you know my back pocket where I go, here's a new campaign idea, let's play. Uh, I have that idea. Unfortunately, I'm I'm waiting for the the, the new packet that's coming out. I, I really feel like running another round of uh, Blades in the Dark, but uh, so I don't quite have it ready. It's it's almost there. So I was hoping to get another game or two in to buy me time. Dot Lords of Mars. Sometimes you can just have your players play the play the bad guys or some other NPCs that are in there for like one or two mm-hmm. sessions to draw them back in, and then slaughter those people and then bring in their PCs that they're playing before to figure out what's going on. They can do some stuff like that where they play the NPCs. Maybe they don't quite remember their character. You give them like a little one-card sheet. Here's what you're playing tonight, and do it maybe for two hours to get them back in the gaming and then say, all right, you guys have your characters. Let's roll into what we were doing. This, remember, everything you just did is going to be involved. Remember the details. Mm-hmm. And you can do something with that as well. So there's a, there's a difference here. We've got two, two things that are going on. On the one hand, we've got the idea of how do you get them back and not blowing the game off mm-hmm. versus how do you grab their attention once they, once they come back to the table post, post-Christmas post or, or post-holidays. Yeah, that's definitely a problem of getting their butts to the table or the screen. And I have found getting people to the, the screen is almost harder than getting them to come to a table. Yes. Because they feel like they can just dick around and do whatever they want at home and whatever. It's, it's horrible. And it's super annoying because you'll be sitting there be like, where is, you know, Frank and whoever else? They're not here yet. Waiting 40 minutes for them. And you know they're sitting in the room because they're posting stuff on Facebook. Yeah. So I just call them out directly. It's the best <laughs> way. Well, for us, the, there have been legit reasons to not be around. I, I cannot even in, in the slightest, most jokingest manner suggest that they were blown us off. But... uh uh, yeah, it's it's still it's still one of those patterns that you see so often that it's really really hard to disregard as just oh it's just coincidence you know. If you were at a birthday party and had a hangover, it's easier for you to sit in front of a screen with your camera off and play than get in your clothes, get in your car, and drive to someone's house. But I find they're more likely to drive to my house than show up on yeah. screen. Yeah, I, I'm with you 100. I think that, that's absolutely been been my experience with that too. So. You serve uh, really good snacks. <laughs> it's about investment. Uh, one of the things that they've noticed is that <clears throat> uh, I've actually had this discussion with lots of people. It's about why you you oftentimes sell a game even though you don't really care about the the profit margin of it. It's that if people will pay for something or if they drive somewhere or if they do a thing, they become invested. There's a there's a certain amount of I have put in work. So, you know, and then... Well, it's investment and habit. They say five weeks develops habit. You do something for five weeks straight. That's why I hate bi-weekly games. I'd rather yeah. just run a set of three games and then be done. Because uh, bi-weekly games, we have one on Monday, and you always forget what you're doing. It is investment. You're, you're totally right. It's investment and habit. You have to develop a habit. And it takes, they say, five weeks for a human to develop a habit. Hmm. So, yeah... Maybe that, that, that might be a thing 
trying to... Uh, so, actually, what's really funny is uh, I have three regular game kind of nights, I'll, I'll call them. Uh, I have the bi-weekly Saturdays, and then I have uh, Wednesday one-shots, and Tuesday we're usually doing a, a game that's not really one-shots. We play, like, a game through, but they're not necessarily very long games. Um, and so the the Tuesday and the Saturday is what blipped. So I had one that was weekly, and I had one that was bi-weekly. So I don't know. I don't know if that theory holds water. So Now... Is, are these face-to-face -face ones, right? Or, yeah, or I, I pretty much I, I play everything face-to-face. -face. I've never actually gotten enough. Uh, actually, I'll tell you what. I'm I'm kind of embarrassed to admit this because anytime we actually do play online, like when whenever Effie organizes like Sunday morning swords or something, I do all the research. I get everything installed. I get prepped before time. But I still have this like absurd fear that I don't have enough of the tech down. So I just I find face-to-face -face easier. And I'm blessed mm -hmm. in the in the concept that. I have a lot of friends nearby and a lot of people who are into getting together for games, so I'm not like, you know, somewhere in the middle of nowhere where online is my only option, so. Online, though, like, I use Roll20 for our games, and, and Roll20 is only a hindrance when you're doing a very tactical game. It's awesome that it allows you to do it for people who play Pathfinder. Our Monday Night game is a Pathfinder. It's great you can do it. GM has a lot more prep. But if you're going to play something like 13th Age, um... Numenera, any of the indie games where it's not tactical based, it's super easy. All you really need to do is get some images together, drag and drop them on a screen, and you can show off everything you want to see. Mm -hmm. Just tell your players to have their stats at their table and roll at their table. You trust them, they don't even need to roll on the screen. Because that's the stuff that takes time, is entering all the data. Uh, for most of the, I mean, the indie games that I play, I all those games I listed in the uh, the whooshing minute and a half, <laughs> they're all over Hangouts. I don't have a face to face group right now. It's one of my gaming resolutions. So I'm I'm going to try to find one, but I it's you know we're a little further further afield here, Stosh, But I, I would be happy to walk you through the process because it's it's a lot easier than you think, and it's really satisfying to be able to select based on not who happens to be near me and happens to like a thing I'm like and and also is willing to try XYZ game get you to reach out into the ether and say who wants to play this specific game and then time zones are the only other trouble you gotta deal with so I, don't yeah. I, I really want to start playing some other games that my group's not playing I like to play, mm -hmm. I don't ever get to play, I always run and I always end up defaulting to running because I end up enjoying it more than playing um, but I would love to play, like, I want to play a Judge Dread game really bad. I think it would be so much fun if I don't play it, I want to run it. I know Alex Mayo wants to, to run one, mm -hmm. he wants to also do Dragon Age Inquisition. We both kind of talked about it. I have a great, like, four-episode arc I want to do for a Judge Dread. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Is, is, I have is there an actual arc. system for that? Yes, there's two different systems oh, for it, okay. actually. Even better. Uh, I only three, read the comics. Actually, I think. Three, actually, yeah. This oh, game's wow. did one. There's a D6 and a D22. Yeah. I like the D6 system a lot because it's quick and fast. The yeah. GW one is painful, and it's like pulling oh, your toes terrible. and your teeth. Terrible. What's that? It's, it's very early, too. It's like oh, 82. Yeah. I would love to do I have a fantastic... <laughs> I've been reading a lot of Judge Dredd comics. The new stuff is really, really good. I've been. I, I read the old stuff in 2000 AD. Right. And, uh, I've seen the movies, of course, but uh, I haven't actually seen the games. So that's the that's new awesome. comics are outstanding, and it's just given me like this plethora of ideas of crazy stuff I could run. And it's such a zany, insane, gritty, not gritty satire world that I think it'd be hilarious. So I'm gonna throw out. Uh, I don't. I don't know how much more we have on this topic. Uh, but I have, I have a question when you're done, so go ahead. Uh, bring it on. I'll All right, so this in mind. your group that you said right now that you're losing, is this a face-to-face -face group, right? Yeah, it is. Uh, is it just one or two people, or is it a lot of the people in the group that are not wanting to come? Is it two-parter? I need to know that part first. All right, so we have four people that are playing. Yeah, and one of them... Uh, well, actually, this is... So a couple of situations are changing. One of them was a girl that was working, like, 60-hour weeks, and she was trying to look into also at the same time working on changing her career to something new. And so um, one of the things that happened is she actually talked to her boss and she's switching to going part-time, so now she should have more time because before she, this was like the only day a week that she could hang out with people and it was every other week, so that should, that should give you some idea. 
So, yeah, and so she had to do something for her new career stuff last game, and she was like, listen, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to have to can. And then uh, one person got sucked away into a hobby, uh, which, that's a long story, um, and has, yeah, so he's, he's, he flaked out, 100% flaked, and the last person, the third person, was returning that day several hours earlier via flight to get home from a two-day, like, uh, burial of a family member. So we just just called it. Uh, But the Tuesday night thing, just everyone came back from vacation, and one of the things that happens when you're gone for a week, uh, a number of my friends are programmers, and when you get back, there is that mountain of work that's been waiting for you because, you know, you're not there to do it. And so a lot of people got slammed. There were, like, server migrations and a lot of work excuses, so... All right, so my part two to this is, um, obviously, your three nights you play. It's not like there's a lot of different people between those three nights. That's probably why you have the three nights. Yeah. There's, there's, I'm a, little, yeah. there's a few that are through them, but... Um, so the ones that are through them all, those are probably the reliable ones. So the ones that are unreliable, do you guys have an alt game that you play when people can't show up? Uh, I'm usually prepared. So I usually have stuff in my bag, but uh, we decided the new expansion for Sentinels of the Multiverse, which is a card game, came out. And so we were just like, oh, did game get canned? Well, it's time for some Sentinels, so... Well, I was talking, uh, for our group, what we've done in the past is we have our main game for... Excuse me, you obviously have the one-shot night, but your main campaign that you run a little more long-term, however long-term that may be, we have an alt game because there's always somebody who can't make it for some damn reason. And that alt game is episodic, and it's like watching TV where there's always characters that aren't there. Yeah. Um, Okay. And I always have a backup game, and that backup game, I usually base it in modern or future. I feel it's a little easier for people to understand because they watch TV. Um, And it's episodic to where everyone has a character. Every adventure we do is start and finish. There's no layover in between. There's no, if there's a connection, it's a light connection, but nobody has to be there. Mm -hmm. Um, And then behind the scenes, everyone levels equally. It's not a punishment for not being there. Everyone levels or gets experience or whatever you get for playing equally. Um, and I do basically a pilot season. And when that pilot season's over, we decide if we still want that to be an alt game or pick up a new alt game. And they run them all like a 30-minute to an hour episode. And that's awesome because sometimes people aren't in episodes because on TV, you know, they're look at like the old General Hospital days. There's one guy who's got a freaking thing where he doesn't, he doesn't, uh, he's not on a single episode during the summer because that's his vacation time. And then he comes back as a new character in General Hospital. The girl watches it. I don't understand it. It blows my mind. I want that job. That is the best job ever. But all you do is have like an in and out. So whatever someone's background, occupation, or something else they do is always what they're doing when they're not there. That's and a, a lot idea. of times if it's, Someone doesn't show up to my session because they're hungover and I was at a birthday party. That's why their character is not there for that session. So it works really well for modern and future. That's my backup plan. Um, And the only issue with this backup plan is after playing that week, people want to play that versus playing the main game. (laughs) Yeah. Nice. You have to be careful about that. So you have to cut it and you're like, no, no, it's only the alt. you got to put that hard line down and roll them in. But it makes people show up. And, and make the uh, – I think it works best when you have the genres different from one another. Um, right. Uh, that, that if you're doing a fantasy game, whatever is the alt game is, you know, Victoriana or whatever. We did that with our game. We had a backup game for – we had two players that were most often missing, so we could count if one was out, the other one was out, and we had something for the other three players. Nice. Uh, I, I do really good idea. I want to say something, too, uh, that John John mentioned last recording we did of this. When we were talking about trying to keep things organized when you come into a session, we were talking about investigations and stuff, and he said at the start of the session, you write down the plots, the big things on index cards and put them out there on the table, just a handful, you know, the, the, the key things. Uh, and I will say, I since he mentioned that, I've been doing that every session, and really good response from the players. They really love it. They really enjoy it. Even if they've forgotten what happened, uh, you know, they go, oh, okay, yeah, because we had a big break with the L5R game. We were gone for, it's bi-weekly, and we missed two sessions, and they were like, what the hell? 
but I had the cards there, and they went, oh, yeah, we're in the middle of this investigation. Here are the characters, and they were right back in it within five minutes. Um, and I if, I had just, yeah, if I had just blurbed it, it wouldn't have been as good. That works really well. I took it that John was talking about that. I use Post-it notes because they roll up, and I post all the notes on um, a larger piece of paper and post them down. And on the back piece of the post-it note has extra details if they figured anything out. I just roll it up and I stick it off to the side and mm. I unroll it and set it on the table in the beginning of the game or hang it on the wall if you have a spot to hang it. But then on the back, if someone makes their checks kind of remember things, you just pull off that post-it note and hand it to them and let them read the back. Strash, you were going to say something? Oh, yeah. No, this is this is a really good idea. I was actually there when John said it, and some, for some reason I've... I've just not done that. I think I'm, I, I think I might give that a shot, particularly because I already take notes during game. I have this little, little skin, small one that I carry around with me that I usually put game notes in. So it's it's not even a, a job. I can just literally whip out those those index cards in like the span of 15 minutes. So I think that's that's actually kind of brilliant, and I think I'll start mm -hmm. doing that. Nice. And so, Strash, uh, is there anything else we could do to... Popcorn you with ideas. Nah, you, you guys have been killing it. Uh, I wanted to bring one more thing in, which is something that we've been doing because of this, uh, and I wanted to run it by you guys and sort of shock collars to tase them when they don't show up. <laughs> no, actually, this is this is really funny. We've started uh, designing a play by post uh, because one of the problems that people have is that sometimes there's like the the other commitments, and it's not that they don't have two hours or four hours in a week. It's that they don't have four hours in one sitting on a specific day that's tied to other people's schedules. And so uh, Play My Post originally only existed because, you know, nerds were lonely in a town and they didn't have people nearby that they could play with, so that was one of the ways that we could, we could interact. But, you know, with awesome video connections like you guys are totally pros at, uh, it's, it's kind of fallen out of favor. And I'm, I'm looking at it, and I, I know a lot of people that have, you know, have young kids or something that, that really kind of crushes their time commitments. Uh, but I'm really thinking that this is kind of a genre that's been abandoned that could potentially be looked at again as sort of something that people could do in their own time. Have you ever had either experience with that or used that to sort of supplement a game? Yes. I'm playing in seven play-by-post games concurrently. Okay, so do tell. It hasn't been abandoned. <laughs> um, so Storium was a really successful Kickstarter that came uh, out last year, and they just released the Gamma update with a ton of new features, and it's a really cool story-first um, oriented type of game that has its own built-in system that has some similarities with Power, uh, Power by the Apocalypse, just some slight similarities, but it's a card-based system. Um, and it, it's pretty fun. Uh, and I know Lowell's doing a bunch of... You've done a bunch of Storium as well, right, Lowell? Uh, no, I haven't done any Storium. Oh, I've backed oh. it, but I haven't tried it. Yeah, yeah, you should. Give it a shot. Um, okay. It's The player attrition, unfortunately, is pretty high. Uh, but, you know, I'm hoping at some point that I'll get a game that lasts a while. Now, the games that I'm playing right now are on two sites. One is a, a homegrown vanilla forum that a friend of mine in Canada runs. Uh, and I've got a few games going on there. Uh, another one is Tavern Keeper. Now, Tavern Keeper was a failed Kickstarter. Uh, I didn't even know they had play-by-post functionality when they did their Kickstarter because they were kind of couching it around the idea of, of like an obsidian portal, an answer to an obsidian portal. And they have some pretty neat features for creating a group and having a wiki and then being able to actually start Hangouts from the Tavern Keeper website. But I don't use any of that crap. It's all the play-by-post stuff. It's really, really pretty cool. Uh, and both those websites are, are free to use and uh, pretty awesome. And Storium is a very low, like, I kicked in, so I've got that, but I think it's about 20 bucks per year uh, when they actually launch out of beta or beta gamma, whatever. When they go official, it's going to be about 20 bucks per year. So it's pretty co low cost. Do you think you could use play by post to uh, fill a time frame when people can't make it for game sessions? Like, use that, be like a, um, bulletin board's wrong, but like a, what they're doing when the group isn't together, how they communicate, or what's going on in the world, and do a play-by-post, and have that be the background. I know you could do it in sci-fi games really easily, Shadowrun, things along those lines, but even in fantasy, do you think there's a way you could do it to, like, what's going on in the town they're in, and that would help pe keep people interested? 
during those downtimes? I, I think you absolutely could. I think it takes. Um, it's going to take a kind of system that's very light. If you want to get into map combat or if you want to run that kind of stuff, your timelines are going to get really out of whack. Um, but absolutely, you can use that as a supplement, especially if, like, where you had talked about playing other characters, or I, you know, I mentioned as well, playing other characters within the world, so that when that asynchronous happens, it's it's okay. I actually run, uh, at one point last year, I tried an experiment where I had one setting and I had concurrently a play-by-post that was going on at the same time of a live Hangout game, and the Hangout game was bi-weekly. And I was able to keep them pretty much along the very same timeline, and things were flowing back and forth. There were a couple of player overlaps where... I've done that with multiple gaming groups before. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was pretty fun. It was pretty fun. Now, the problem that I ran into that had nothing to do with play-by-post. It was the fact that um, they were... The, Hangout group was all West Coast, and we were playing at midnight my time, and I just I couldn't keep up. I couldn't. I think I might try doing this to use the play by post for a, a group that has an organization that has other people that work under them. Yeah. I think they can play those people who work under them that are getting all the shit done that the main PCs don't have time for. That would be fun. Uh, there, there's a particular route that that I used to take, and this is probably something that everybody has done before. Um, uh, especially in an NPC heavy game where uh, essentially that's a chance for, for players to interact with the other NPCs or talk to somebody they want to talk to or you know do romantic stuff or whatever. And certainly my friend Scott who does a Pathfinder campaign, that's what he does in the two weeks between sessions. That that there's a lot of emailing and stuff. He's running just one game, so he can do that. I can't do that anymore because I'm running so many games. But uh, the one problem, the one difficulty you have to make sure, especially if you're going to set up something like that where there is email interactions, you're using that as a thing, is that doesn't work for some people. Some people aren't into that. And and you then, then you might find that you're getting some people who are monopolizing your time on that and are really getting a lot out of it, and some people aren't. And even if the people who aren't, they, they I mean, it's their fault, they're not doing it, they, they can get a resentment between the haves and the have-nots then, and I've seen that at the table, that, that they think they're, other people are getting more stuff out of the game, you know, or learning things when the game ought to be just at the table. So if you're going to do it, you need to do it such that it isn't impacting the plot or it's it's really very parallel, not, not intersecting in with it. I think that comes back to the whole transparency conversation of this is what we're doing with this campaign to help with all... Listen, guys, it's your fault I have to do this. You're not showing up. And you guys are that, I have a way to fill that with almost like a mini game of what we're doing on the sidelines when everybody's not there. You know, it's true, though. You gotta. I'm sorry, man. The GM doesn't need to yeah. take all the blame. Sometimes the blame goes to the players. Period. I spend time to be ready. You should spend time to show up. If you can't, then this is our alt thing to kind of keep everybody in the mindset of gaming. But I agree. That's like making someone play an indie game when all they do is play miniature games. Like, mm -hmm. they, they are going to have a problem. So you have to make sure they're okay with it up front. I, I, I do agree with that. And I think I would just use a, for me, for simplicity, I would just use a um, Google community, one of the community hangs, and just yeah. chat it up in there. I'd make different threads. This thread's about in the city. This thread's about out the city. And then pff, go from there. Yep. Google Plus Community works great for playoffs. Yeah, Straz, and that that you say you you use that. Does that record all that stuff? Are you able to keep track of everything there pretty easily? Yeah, the last time I did anything even remotely like this, it was I'm about to show my age. Uh, it was about a decade ago. I was running like a 40 person LARP, and they run into similar problems with the with the holidays, particularly because if you're running them at something like a college, uh, you're going to be you know, the, there's winter break and school and summer break and whatnot. So I would run secondary games, but we would use the forums to keep it alive. But, uh, yeah, we, we the one that we just started, we're doing exactly like that. We're doing a, a Google Plus community, and we have, like, in-character, out-of-character, you know, like, rules discussion, blah, blah, blah. And so, like, you have the different categories, and so you just slot your things where you need it to go, and uh, that's, that's what's up. Hmm. Nice. Play by post. That's how you revive your campaign. You find <laughs> you to the table. Go so old school, they have to do it. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're kind of cheating because we're actually working on a new game, but uh, I, I'll, I'll see if I can apply it to the old games as well. I think it's actually something that might might revitalize sort of things, particularly over break. So. Cool. 
Well, uh, I'm glad that we could solve all your problems in this Saturday when your game starts up. It's going to be amazing, Strash. You are invigorated by the genius of John Stavropoulos, who's not even here, and some other stuff we said. And, and let, me, let me add on to that. Uh, I just realized, I remember another tool we use, uh, collective puzzle solving. Uh, uh, logic puzzles or something like that built in-game that you give the whole group to work on in between grades. We're talking about something that's tactile. I've done that, and that's that's been useful. There's another one. Oh, you just basically voiced a puzzle on them right before break? They got to... Uh, in the middle of the break, I, I gave them, here are a set of puzzles for the, for the competition that you guys are at. I'll see you at the table. And then they all kind of worked on it and chatted with each other and figured it out. It's fun. That's cool. cool. I've done the alternate reality stuff for downtimes on a Christmas for a modern game. That worked really well as well. Oh, okay. It's a lot more work, though. I'm not going to lie. It, it sucks ass. <laughs> It, it helped a lot. I will never do it again, but man, it was awesome. Nice. All right. Well, I think we have uh, we've, we've beaten this dead horse quite a bit. Uh, thank you guys uh, so much for coming on, Strush. Thanks for talking about uh, your concerns, and I hope that things go well. I really... I'm excited to try some of this stuff for Saturday. I'll report back. Okay. Good. we got to get Good. you playing online. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Gotta do it, man. I will. I will mentor you. I will walk you through, baby. <laughs> I'm excited. I want to try it. <laughs> Sweet. All right. Well, uh, then if it, let's go ahead and uh, we'll, we'll put this uh, in the can. Thank you, guys, all again for uh, this imaginary life, and we hope that you found something useful. If you haven't, if you've got questions that you need answered, if there are issues at your table reach out to us. Let us know. Um, ping any one of us and uh, we'll, we'll hop on and talk about it. We can even talk with you about it. If you want to come on the show, we did that last year and it was pretty successful. So uh, excited to help people out or help each other out as the case may be. So thanks so much and uh, have a great night.